In episode 18, I speak in depth with former professional footballer turned actor Frank LeBeouf. Frank has played over 200 games for Chelsea, winning two FA Cups, one League Cup, a Cup Winners' Cup, and a UEFA Super Cup. If that wasn't enough, he has also been capped 50 times for France, winning the Confederations Cup, the European Championships, and of course, the FIFA World Cup, where in the final, he was given the daunting task of man-marking the most prolific goal scorer on the planet, Brazil's Ronaldo. Since hanging up his boots, Frank is now an established actor and even starred in an Oscar-nominated film. Sit back and enjoy a look back at the incredible career and transition of Frank LeBeouf. Episode 18, and I cannot think of a more appropriate guest today than a man who lifted the World Cup trophy in 1998 with France, wearing the number 18, Frank LeBeouf. Welcome, my friend. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you very much. Thank you to uh, uh, hi to everybody. And it's true, I r- realize as well the number 18 for you, episode 18, which is kind of uh, a sign, let's say. Oh, some things are written in the stars, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Frank, you've had an incredible career, an incredible journey in football, and success has followed you everywhere you have gone. Let's go right back to the beginning. Born in Marseille, tell me a little bit about your family, your upbringing, and where your first, uh, when you first fell in love with football. Well, the thing is, uh, my family is from Champagne, and uh, my father played for the Stade de Reims, uh, the mm-hmm. famous club, the most, one of the famous club, simply the, fam- the most famous club in the 50s, where Copa, Fontaine played, and uh, had a fantastic World Cup in 58, when they reached mm-hmm. the semi-final. You have also that uh, Rennes uh, reaching the final of the what we call now the Champions League, uh, and they lost against Copa and Real Madrid. But uh, my my father played in the, in, the, in the academy when he was very young. Then moved to Marseille, and uh, my brother and I were we were born there, and uh, and it was a very nice childhood in a way that we are living in a little uh, village called Saint Cyr sur Mer in the in the French Riviera. Uh, my father was a plumber, but working very hard, and uh, we had the chance because he built uh, his uh, his own swimming pool, and we were living, you know, in a nice way when nice. I was going with my bi- bicycle at school and playing football with my friend until dawn, and uh, that was that was absolutely uh, perfect, you know, just thinking about. Uh, being trying to be good at school and being mm-hmm. very good at football. <laughs> Is it true that when you were four years old, you told your mother you wanted to be an actor? Yes. Well, I was watching lots of uh, plays with my mother on TV, mm-hmm. and uh, and uh, she told me that I said to the to her that I wanted to do that when I would be uh, older. I'd never thought that football was a job, in fact, per Mm se. I I really thought that it was just an entertainment. And uh, I only realized that after maybe 12 years old. And and then I I said, okay, I want to be a football player. But before, yeah, being an actor was an option. But Mm -hmm. very, very early, I realized that it would be difficult because if you're not in Paris, it's complicated. And um, I couldn't follow... Um, acting classes, and so my father was a coach of the the the, the, mm-hmm. the academy of my village, <laughs> and therefore I went into it, and and I put acting aside until the end of my career. So at sixteen, you're spotted. You get your first opportunity with a first proper club. Um, is that at the end of that season, then both you and several of your teammates were released because of financial problems within the club, um, and then I believe you took out an ad in a local newspaper or magazine seeking a professional club. Is that right? That's exactly what, what happened. Um, I was uh, um, uh, sacked by the academy at the age of 18 after two years uh, playing for them. Um, mm-hmm. You have to know that people knock at the door uh, at the age of 10 years old and every year you know, to hire me and my father said, no, no, leave him alone with his friends. Uh, in the village to enjoy his life and still enjoy football. 
And at the age of 16, he allowed the, the, the club to, uh, to, to pick me up. So, and I made some try in Mess, Marseille, and Marseille mm-hmm. say no. <laughs> which, is funny, which is funny because I became the captain some years after. Yeah. Uh, but Toulon say yes. So I stayed two, two, two years, but they made me stop my studies and okay. uh, a year before getting my degree to tell me that uh, they couldn't keep him, keep me and keep my, all my friends who were 11 players. Uh, because they didn't have any room for us and uh, financially it was impossible. So mm-hmm. I've been released, as you, as you said, but released for nothing because they had nothing, no studies and uh, no clubs because they released us in June and it was impossible to join another mm-hmm. academy. So I was, uh, I would say, in trouble at that time of, yeah. my, of my What life. were you studying, Frank? Um, how do you say? Uh, commercial and economy. And, uh, okay. And, okay. Yeah. But I had to stop, and um, well, you know, it, it's a it's a hard time. But I think at 18 years old, you don't consider that as a bad time, as long as you enjoy your life as a kid. Mm-hmm. And I never felt the depression. I would say I never felt that I had to wonder if I was okay or not. Mm-hmm. I had to go for something. I have to, uh, and um, well, you know, after trying some different stuff, I said, no, I want to be a football player, so I'm going to do everything to do so. So you enjoyed your time at Laval, they gave you an opportunity, and then you went from strength to strength. You spent five years at Strasbourg, of course, and then you came to the attention of Chelsea. Was it always an ambition of yours to go to the Premier League? And how did this move come about? Because that was an exciting time in English football at that time. Yeah, that's, that, that, that's true. The thing is, um, I wanted to play in the Premier League. We didn't, couldn't have any... Too much highlights, I say, about the, the Premier League at the time. It wasn't called the Premier League, but uh, the only thing we could see was a little bit of the uh, for the, the the ten years before I signed for Chelsea was mainly the final of the FA Cup, mm-hmm. and um, and uh, we had in seventy six the chance Saint Etienne played many times against Liverpool, and uh, and uh, and I followed Ipswich Town as well. Really? Uh, oh. Yes, yes, I remember that with the. Reg- um, the, the regretted um, uh, Mariner. Uh, play, yeah. I worked with him after uh, for ESPN. Mm-hmm. I know he passed away like a year, a year, mm-hmm. a year ago, and uh, we were all very sad. But yeah, if, if Swiss Town was a big club, and Liverpool also was a very big club. Chelsea, Chelsea was completely unknown, I have to say. Mm-hmm. And uh, and after we had Ginola signing for uh, Newcastle and Cantona, but we couldn't see too much of them. Mm-hmm. But my I had the possibility to sign Italy, Lazio, and the Fiorentina wanted me, and I think, I think in Spain also Sevilla and Valencia wanted me. But I had in my mind that if I had the possibility to go to England, I would learn English, and I would wow. help me. It would help me out after my career yeah. if I had a career. And um, and it was and I said, I said okay, on top of it, it was my kids would speak English that would help them a lot, you know, in their life. And it's why I went for it. And when mm-hmm. you have Ruud Gullit calling you, the Ballon d'Or, the famous uh, Dutch yeah. guy, you know, uh, dreadlocks and everything, with all this his charisma, yeah. I said, how can you say no to somebody like that? On top of it, Viali just signed before, mm-hmm. Marcus was already there, Dan Petrescu, so many fantastic players. And of course, and I won't forget it because otherwise he's going to be upset, our captain, Dennis Weiss. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but really, it was... Uh, they wanted to create something to rebuild the club. They didn't win anything for 26 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, for me, coming from Salzburg, they paid me a lot, I have to say. And, uh, and everything was, wow, it's a fairy tale. You're going to start something. We want you to be the skipper of the team with, uh, alongside Denis Weiss and some of the others. We love you. We're so happy you don't play for, for the Euro 96 that you're on the bench. Like that nobody's going to steal, steal, uh, steal you from us. So I want you to come. That was the, Nice. The speech, the speech, the really good speech. And I said, okay, I come. And I signed uh, for that fantastic club. It was a very exciting time. You know, as I told you, I'm a Manchester United fan, but, you know, Chelsea had an exciting team that time with all the Italian influence and many of big names from across Europe were coming into the club. So it was an exciting time for sure. But it wasn't all rosy, was it? Tell us a little bit about your first impressions when you landed in England and the training facilities. Well, I was very amateur. I'm, I mean, they didn't have a uh, Cobham uh, facilities that they have now. 
uh, we were we were training um, close to his row, so we had to stop playing, uh, to stop talking. The coach had to stop talking every time the concord was taking off <laughs> at the time, uh, and it was very windy. It was close to the uh, to the yeah. the motorway, as you say in England, mm -hmm. and 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 his row, uh, that was a nightmare. So it was either to the pitch was either too soft because it was raining a lot in England, or it was too dry because of the wind, uh, and it was a little bit on the side like that. I mean, it was on the descent. On the side, well, that was a, yeah, an Imer. You had like six or seven pitches, but uh, none of them mm -hmm. was were perfect. But we we enjoyed because again, we knew that we were at the beginning of something special, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, you know you are among stars, and uh, you play with Zola, Viali, Di Matteo, uh, Marcus, and so many, and Denis Weiss, and so many others, and and uh, and you suddenly because it, the coaches would rule it. You have players like Van Basten, Raika, Niskens, uh, and so many others coming, uh, Kuman, to, uh, to, to uh, pass their exams as a, as a coach. In a, mm -hmm. And they had to go abroad. And they all came and we had a game. And then you see Tony Blair coming with Alistair Campbell. And you, you say, wow, they all come to those <laughs> crazy, stupid, uh, well, ugly facilities because we are Chelsea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but... But we didn't care. We we, we had yeah. the what I read said the sexy football and that was more than enough for us. <laughs> yeah, it was a great team to watch. It really was. They played fantastic football. Didn't enjoy so much playing against them, but that's another story. <laughs> Frank, you've played with some of the greatest players down the years for both club and country. But there's one I want to ask you about because, and this is an exclusive for anybody listening to this, an upcoming guest of the show. Gianfranco Zola. Now, the word genius comes to mind when I think of Zola. We only had the opportunity to watch him on a Saturday on TV. What was it like on a day-to-day -day basis, training with and against him? Tell us a little bit about your experience with Gianfranco Zola. How good was he? Well, it was good when you play with him, when you play against <laughs> him, even in the training ground. That wasn't, <laughs> that wasn't uh, easy. And... Uh, and pleasant, but uh, on top on top of the player that everybody who had the chance to see him, mm -hmm. that he was absolutely fantastic. I think it's the mentality of the person. He comes from Sardinia, a little yeah. island in uh, in Italy, and the guy is very down to earth. He was mm -hmm. one of the best players in the world, if he's not. I mean, he kicked out Maradona from Napoli, in Naples, uh, when he came when he came, and then uh, played in some other clubs. But uh, when he came to Chelsea we had the chance to play with the best of the best. I mean, he was named the best player ever at Chelsea and it's mm -hmm. well deserved, you know? And, uh, and um, you know, and it's like when I play with Zidane with the national team, where you know that, yeah, you can struggle. Yeah, you can do whatever you want, but you need something special on top. It, the guy's going to produce that. That's, uh, mm -hmm. you don't know, you don't know what's going to happen. Suddenly Zola comes or Zidane comes and they change the game and you win. That's yeah. what, how fantastic players like Ronaldo, like Messi, like uh, mm -hmm. uh, Neymar or maybe Mbappe now, that you have those players who are able to do so. Mm -hmm. Gianfranco was absolutely amazing and a fantastic fellow, a great teammate. Uh, you could have told him, come on Gianfranco, move, move. Okay, Frank, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> that was another era, I guess. But uh, uh, I played with many fantastic players. I, I can name him, and he, he played for you for Manchester United, Marcus. Yes. What a yeah. what a delight to play with a player like that because that a was warrior. A, a, a warrior. It was a relief for the defense. You, mm -hmm. you you aim him, you give him the ball. He can keep for forty seconds and kick people around, yeah. and you have the time to get out. Gianfranco, in, another, in a different way, he was. Uh, yeah, helping us out. Gianfranco is, I mean, to describe him, everybody him saw him scoring goals that I saw and I'm sorry against Manchester United. But sometimes you're like, uh, you're, you're like somebody in the stand, you know, you just watch. I think even I applauded that one looking at the TV. It was, yeah, he made us look so stupid. They just stood there, I remember. It was incredible. Well, but you're but, not the only one, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about Mark Hughes there just quickly. Uh, he's a prime example of somebody who, just transformed when he crossed the white line. He was so quiet off the pitch, but what a warrior on the pitch. He really, really was. And you know, if he went, if he, he wasn't one of these players to go down injured or to even look for a free kick, if he was down, you knew he was genuinely hurt.
Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That wasn't for 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 fun. No. That it was would be on the on the floor. But have you seen his calves? I mean, these calves oh, were God. our thighs. You know that that's yeah, the thing. Yeah, you yeah. know to explain. I've seen him because that was really what he was doing. I I, I remember giving him giving him a, a fantastic assist in, against Crystal Palace when he made the volley. I mean, that, that was mm-hmm. the. A long ball from me, and he, he didn't control the ball. He just turned and, and smashed it and volleyed it. On top of his technique, mm-hmm. uh, as you said, how he was protecting the ball, that was absolutely yeah. great. And it was a real relief. I remember giving him the ball and seeing him with three players and uh, fighting and, and ending it ending it with the three players on the floor and him still with the ball, you know? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That sums him up to a T. At the, Absolutely. At the point that when he left Chelsea and signed for Southampton and we played mm-hmm. against, I came to him and said, don't stay in the middle. I don't want to see you. Get out. Get out <laughs> on the other side. I don't want to see you. I don't want to be ridiculous. And he went out. He went out. He was nice. He was... So one thing I'd like to ask you is about France. Uh, going into the 1998 World Cup, you know, France is a big footballing nation. Okay, you you hadn't won the World Cup up to that point, but you're European champions in 84, and there was always an expectation there. Going into that tournament as the host nation, especially, was there a lot of pressure or expectation on the players? Uh, no, not at all. We were okay. a very bad team, according to the medias, <laughs> and uh, oh, no, no, nothing, no way we're going to win. It was funny because uh, even some actors involved in plays were offering 50% to all uh, women, and uh, especially women or men wanted to go to theaters if they they didn't want to be bothered by that stupid World Cup in 98. <laughs> well, they had to shut down. They had to shut down everything after the first game. So because they had nobody in the in the yeah. theater, everybody was uh, was. Um, switching on the, the TV every time we played and, uh, and, and mm-hmm. women the first because they wanted to see that fantastic team play, mm-hmm. playing together, cheering up with, uh, with, mm-hmm. uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the population and really we, we had that um, chemistry immediately with the, with the population. It's, why, mm-hmm. it's how it became very important. It was in France, it was mm-hmm. the first time, it was against Brazil in final, everything was like a fairy tale and that's uh, that's why it, it became like like crazy. But don't forget, since that, France played. I don't want to be mistaken. I think three final in six World Cup and mm-hmm. one two. So it says a lot about that that uh, that country having won the three trophies that you can win with the national team. It's absolutely spectacular. Mm-hmm. But again, it's how we. Uh, r- um, interact with the population and between each other that we made something special. 2018, they won the World Cup, but it's different. It was in Russia against Croatia, with all due respect. But uh, in terms of football, we didn't feel something special. Yeah. We felt in the 98 that we were invincible. We, we were lucky because you need luck. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were lucky. But when we played against Brazil, nobody had doubts in the final that we will win. So you were a squad player uh, throughout the tournament, it's safe to say, but then the suspension of Laurent Blanc. At what point did you realize or did the manager come to you and say, okay, Frank, I need you for the final, you're starting the final, and oh yeah, I want you to mark that guy, uh, Ronaldo. (laughs) (laughs) Well, well, two months before the World Cup, Emi Jacquet uh, uh, asked me to come to his, uh, his office and he said, listen, I've decided, and it's, it's my choice, that Laurent Blanc and Marcel Desailly will be the pair in, uh, in, uh, in the central defense. So, so you're going to be the third. If mm-hmm. either of them is injured or, or, or red carded, you're going to play. Okay. Are you fine with that? Or if you're not fine, you don't come. If you're fine, you come, but you shut up. <laughs> I say, okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, and then when, uh, when Laurent was red carded, uh, Amy turned to me and said, Frank, get changed. But I only realized like 10 minutes after, on the field, that uh, if we win that game, that I will be playing the final. And mm. I started shaking and I said, oh my God, oh. my God, my God. <laughs> don't get it, don't get it, uh, don't get red carded, you know, be just really tuned in. And uh, because I didn't touch the ball for like, or just a header in 10 minutes. So I was mm. afraid because I didn't warm up, I was afraid to get injured. And yeah. so, well, it happened uh, uh, that it worked very well and uh, we did everything we had to do and I uh, played that, that final. So. Um, I always say that it was very sad and unfair for Laurent Blanc, but uh, that's mm. life, you know. Uh, that's football, yeah. 
I had to do what I had to do. Okay, so you're preparing for the biggest game of your life. You know, there's a lot of focus needed there and, you know, mental preparation as well as physical. But the whole mystery surrounding Ronaldo, you know, he's not going to play. Then he is going to play. Did that uh, interfere with your mental preparation at all? Well, no, we really don't care because uh, um, we were told in the morning around after the training session, I think, um, of the morning. And But I knew that I, if it wasn't him, it would have been Edmundo or Rivaldo or Bebeto. So, well, you know, that's kind of names that you have to uh, to accept the power mm -hmm. of and uh and um, so we didn't bother we, we are happy if he doesn't play mm -hmm. good <laughs> one less problem <laughs> but uh it will it will be other people roberto carlos said and uh, i think ronaldo that he was was there when the uh, ronaldo had the problem and it's yeah. like sun, suddenly like that the guy started to shake and mm -hmm. to, to 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 spit some uh, white yes. stuff you know he was frothing and, at uh, the mouth yeah yeah, and uh, they, they brought him to the hospital, but um, that was because of the final. That so it was, was nerves, was it? There was nerves, it was nerves, yeah. I thought it was yeah. an epilepsy crisis, but he, I was told last weekend that it was just because the guy was under stress. And, okay. uh, and, uh, and, uh, and so he, he, got, he got, and Roberto Carlos told him when he started to shake, he said, well, let's stop that, stop that, because it's not funny, you know, uh, please. It's in, and he saw him getting crazy and they brought him oh. to the hospital and he was fine after. Uh, it, and they decided to, to make him play. He played well. He had a good game. But when I, it's not only me. Of course, I, I, I marked him. But I had Turam, Karambe, mm -hmm. Desailly, Deschamps and, uh, and, uh, and Petit in front of me. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a hell of a team and a hell of, yeah. of teammates. So I wasn't the only one, of course, to mark Ronaldo. I, I was really much helped by uh, yeah. all the old squad. I find that incredible, actually, because it, it's of all the conspiracy theories there have been down the years since 1998, and there have been many. I never actually stopped to think of something so simple like the occasion got to him. I asked you about France and the the pressure and expectation on the country going into the tournament. But as the greatest striker in the world at that time, I never stopped to think the hope, the pressure, the expectation that was on his shoulders going into that final. It obviously was, what, just too much? Okay, so obviously winning the World Cup, and deservably so. I mean, let, let's point out France, to the best of my knowledge, uh, nobody conceded fewer goals than France in that tournament. Nobody scored more goals than France either. So it was a richly deserved victory. But okay, the pinnacle of your career, you've become a world champion. Did your life change at that point? Did, was it different for you moving forward after that? You're working towards a pinnacle, you've achieved it, and then trying to stay at the top. It did. It did because... Uh... Now you become a t uh, at that point you become a target for the others. You know if you can mm -hmm. humiliate a world champion, uh, the media has as well changed. You know where I was more than welcome uh, by the English media, yeah. especially after the game that we played against England straight after the World Cup and we won two 0 at Wembley, and I commented saying, "Well, the best team won," which is was well, a fact. It was a disgraceful to uh, towards the, uh, uh, the 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 English team. Uh, at that, that that night, we 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 were better a better team. Uh, they, I felt that something was changing, for the best for some many parts, but mm -hmm. for the worst for for other parts, and that's what it is. But you have to accept that. Yes, of course, it changed, uh, and it will change, and it will be like that way until the rest of my life. I mean, I mean, I know what's going to be written. On, or what the media is going to say when I'm going to pass away. Frank LeBeuf, champion of the world, died today. Bye bye. Thank you very much. That was, but <laughs> that's God. that's yeah. But that was that's what it is. That's what it is mm. for the rest of my life because that's something special. It's like mm. a an Oscar Oscar winner or whatever it could be. That's what people are going to say when they're going to leave the planet. And the, and I, I, it changed my life. But I have to say that the fact that I work all around the world that I'm could be none in some other places, it's because I play for Chelsea, because the Premier League mm -hmm. is huge. Not mm -hmm. because I'm champion of the world. I'm introduced as a, as a World Cup champion, but I know that I got that interview and I got that job 
or they asked me to come to Asia or United States because I play for Chelsea. If I work for ESPN right now, it's because I, work, I play for Chelsea and I learned English. But uh, that's, that's really what makes the difference. The Premier mm -hmm. League is absolutely crazy. It's worldwide. Frank, you have enjoyed success everywhere you have gone. Club and country, you know, two FA Cups, a League Cup, a European Super Cup, a Cup Winners Cup, um, internationally the World Cup, the European Championships, and of course the Confederations Cup. In 2001, you left Chelsea, uh, you moved to Marseille, pay, played 51 games for Marseille, you were their captain. Kind of ironic when you think that they turned down the opportunity to sign you when you were younger. Then you moved on to Qatar. You spent two years there, winning more silverware, of course. Big names out there at the time, Gabriela Batistuta, uh, Stefan Effenberg. But you did retire then in 2005. Was that an easy thing for you to prepare? Because I know you had acting in your mind, or, or can you ever fully prepare for that? Was it an easy or a difficult thing for you, football retirement? Uh, now, it was a difficult time, but just to go back to your first question, I played in a movie called um, Taking Sides uh, with Arve Keitel when I was playing for Chelsea. Yes. Uh, yes. Mr. Ran yeah. Ranieri allowed me to go there in Berlin for three days, and I shot that, uh, uh, some scenes. And uh, Sorry, and I came back and I said, so that's what I want to do in my life. So, yes, I was thinking about movie. And when in 2005, I gave up my, uh, my career, uh, it was hard because my father just died before. Mm. I lost the dog that I changed the, the law about um, moving from France uh, to England to, with the shuttle with uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Blair and Lady Fretwell. So we worked on that when I was in England. And uh, I got divorced and I went to Los Angeles where I didn't put a foot before. So mm -hmm. that was, you wake up in the morning and say, well, I have no training session because I retired. Mm -hmm. uh, my father is not here. My family is completely destroyed. It's a, it's a hard time for a man. So it took me like six months uh, to uh, to recover. And because of football and Hollywood United and a fantastic uh, English guy called Jan Carrington that I started to play in Los Angeles for Hollywood yeah. United. And I met some guys like Owen Wilson, uh, um, Steve, um, uh, what is his name? Um, Jason Statham. Jason Statham, Statham uh, but also um, Vinnie Jones. Vinnie Jones, uh, yeah. Steve Jones from the Six Pistols. Well, I, I met those guys and I, I started to have fun with them and life started again. And, I, and on top of it, I followed courses at the uh, Lee Strasberg Institute to become an actor. Um, one thing I really do admire about you, Frank, you went to LA, you know, you studied acting, the art of acting. It's clear you have a passion for it. Was it important for you to like work from the bottom, work your way up and earn those acting jobs on merit as a legit actor, as you said? Um, because it would have been the easiest thing in the world for you to walk in, you know, uh, or make a few phone calls. Look, Frank LaBeouf here, World Cup winner. I'd like to try acting, you know, and you would have got a foot in the door. There's no doubt about that. Many people have taken that route. And I can't blame them for that. But I really admire that you, you made a point of not saying who you are out in LA and many people didn't know who you are. So was that something that was important to you that you really had to earn your stripes in acting? I've always thought that I tried to be legit on when everything I do. Um, and um, I, I never said that I was a football player when I, uh, when I registered mm -hmm. for Lee Strasberg. I said that I was a commercial for people <sighs> to leave me alone. It's only like six okay. months after that the Italian recognized me and, uh, yeah. and, uh, that I, and, and I saw the face of the teachers. Everything's changed. And I didn't okay. like it. I love the okay. first six months when I was able to work and say, why a guy 37 years old wants to know, uh, wants to learn acting? <laughs> Not because I want to be, I want to learn acting. That's the only thing. That's what I want to do. And yeah. it's uh, the American dream, as I as said. But I never mm -hmm. thought it would have been for me so uh, disrespectful towards the acting community, uh, or acting world, to come and say, oh, I'm Frank Lobov, champion of the world. I'm going to be an actor. Mm -hmm. No, no, you have to be, you have to be good first. If you want to be yeah. hired, you have to learn some stuff. No, I played more on, I was more on stage than I played uh, uh, football games. Uh, I, mm -hmm. I was, I've been on stage 1,200 times and I played seven and something like 700 games, wow. which makes me legend. Absolutely. And you've been so busy with it as well. 
um, you know, you're enjoying your stage work. But let's not forget, you also starred in an Oscar-nominated movie as well, The Theory of Everything. Well done. Congratulations on that. Do you have a preference, stage or film? Well, right now, stage work, because I always have the, the main role. So I'm like an hour and 10 or an hour, 15 minutes on stage mm. overall. And it's mm. very, uh, it's very, I feel very good when I'm on stage. Uh, movies, I only had small parts. And I want to mm -hmm. thank all the people who hired me to make me able to understand the process of acting. But the thing is, I'm, I don't want to do that anymore. And I refuse all um, uh, all roles where I'm going to be uh, like, uh, you know, the guest star of the thing. I don't care. I don't need to do that okay. in my life. I, I never did football or movies or plays to be known. I don't care about that. But mm -hmm. the thing is, I, I want to enjoy my time. And one of, I want to be in an actor in a movie where I can create something. I love it. I love it. So I would love, I would love somebody to give me the chance one day to to have a big role to really choose and say, well, I prefer plays or movies. Right now, I cannot mm. say I never been in a big role. I can see your passion coming out when you're talking about it. You know, and I love this. So many footballers, uh, they struggle. Uh, to, to fill that void when they retire, to find something else that gives them so much satisfaction and a buzz. And I can clearly see you've done that. Uh, you found it even before retirement. So, so well done. Is there any link at all there between, you're talking about preferring stage work as a former professional football player. Is there any kind of a link there between feeding off of the live crowd on a football stadium and in the theater? No, because it would never be uh, compared from, to me to football or to any sports, mm. you know, the uncertainty mm. of the result of uh, a game for my part for football, the duality of the game, you know, you're not the only one. You have people yeah. who want to win. And of, on top of it, sometimes you go on stage on the football field and you have people hating you, understand, <laughs> which is which is normally not the case when you go to a theater yeah, where yeah. Uh, people, they pay, they, they're pretty nice to you, they're happy, they're going to have fun. And uh, and you, you normally don't have anybody against you on stage. Uh, so it's a, it's it's a, now it's nothing to compare. The only thing I can say, because I played comedies is. Mm -hmm. I normally always play what we call the white clown. It's never the guy who makes people laugh, but if he's not there, nobody's going to laugh. Yeah. <clears throat> I serve I serve the clowns, clowns, uh, if I may say, like that. Mm -hmm. If I don't launch, if I don't launch my, my, my sentence properly, those mm -hmm. people won't make the, 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 the audience laugh. That's for yes. sure. So yeah, the delivery. It's, yeah. it's like an assist. It's like an yes. assist to deliver and you are a specialist. for the goal. Yeah. Voilà. Okay, and here's a question. I cannot take any uh, credit for this whatsoever, but I heard you ask this question before and I loved your answer to it. So I just wanted to ask you one more time for anybody who didn't hear it. Given the opportunity, would you exchange, would you swap your World Cup winner's medal for an Academy Award, an Oscar? Uh... I don't know why I answered to the first place. But, you don't uh, remember? No. What did I say? <laughs> I, your answer. I loved it. Your answer was, why would you ask me to swap when I could have both? <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm so, so French. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love it. Uh, why not? You've won everything else. <laughs> well, yes. Um, there is a Moliere that you can win in theaters, but it's uh, like a mafia stuff that I hate in France, you know, be, uh, you know, okay, uh, okay. awards that you give between friends. Uh, if you don't belong yeah. to that group, you know, you don't get it. Mm -hmm. So I would never get it because I don't care. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it's, tr it's true that I won the World Cup, but you never know. Maybe one day I will have a fantastic movie with a fantastic director, with a fantastic mm -hmm. editor, because it's fantastic. That's very yes. important. Very and I can win yeah. an Oscar, so I, I, I don't have to swap, I don't have to choose because I can get both. But I'm looking for happiness. I'm very happy in my life. I'm 54 mm -hmm. years old. I do what I, I do, what I want to do, and I can refuse because I have that beautiful choice of life where I can say no to people if mm -hmm. I'm not interested. We have this interview nice. because because I think it was nice to do so, and because I enjoy doing it. I just mm -hmm. look for happiness. 
sharing time with the guys, talking to people, uh, spending time with my lovely wife and my kids uh, at some point. That's what I'm looking for, for the rest of my life. And uh, hopefully it's going to be a, a long, a long uh, path and a long journey still. And, uh, and uh, I will be uh, happy until my last breath. That's the only thing I'm looking for. What a perfect place to leave it. Frank, thank you so much for sharing a little bit of that happiness with us today. Uh, wish you every success for the future in, uh, in theatre and in movies, of course. Um, thank you for your wonderful memories as a football player as well. It's been an absolute joy to sit down and remember them here today. Okay, all the best to you and your family, Frank. Thanks very much. Likewise, right. likewise, Eugene. Likewise.